Hello there, Salim Omar here from the Straight Talk About Small Business Success podcast. I am bringing to you another amazing episode with an amazing guest. His name is Paul Halmy. Paul, welcome. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. That's awesome. To entrepreneurs, Paul is a secret weapon they don't want their competitors knowing about. He's used his business acumen to build his business into one of the most successful gyms in the U.S. This wasn't enough for this former stockbroker, and he became creating high six-figure offline businesses for his clients. And that's resulted in him creating a consulting company, growing well into the seven figures by helping his clients, all the while living a freedom lifestyle of his own design. So Paul, former stock broker <laughs> turned gym owner, turned consultant. Give us a little bit about your backstory. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. I guess it was the, you know, did the American dream with the college, got a, the dream job, family, you know, wife, two kids, dog, house, everything. And just kind of hit that ceiling. We all kind of hit in corporate America where you're kind of like, is this it? I'm just going to keep killing myself for three to 5% raise a year and kind of maxed mm -hmm. out and, and, and trying to, and realizing you're not that happy. And then luckily I'd started doing jujitsu with one of my best friends at the time. And he was working his way into the UFC and I really fell in love with it. And I was like, man, this is a really cool thing. And I started hanging around the guys that had gyms. I'm like, man, they have a really way better lifestyle than I do. They do what they want to do when they want to do it. And they get to travel a bunch. I'm like, man, I kind of want to do this. And my wife was super supportive. So I made that leap in entrepreneurship had the gym and then built the gym up. And then that led into people keep asking me like, Hey, how'd you do this? How'd you do that? And then a different friend and I, we said, we should just start a consulting company and just help people, you know, cause everybody knows when you get all free advice out, people don't listen, you know, there's kind of like, Oh yeah, cool. And then they don't do it when they're paying for a membership or consulting. They're like, Hey, I better get this done. It's like, well, yeah, you're paying me mm. to get this result. And it's just a lot of fun. We really grew fast. And of course, you know, then 2020 happens, a pandemic hits and we're consulting for non-essential businesses and running non-essential businesses. So 2020, 2021 were tough years, you know, and then just had to persevere, you know, make a lot of pivots, push through it. And then, you know, now things are finally kind of like, oh, maybe we're getting a little better now. <laughs> so it's, mm, it's been an interesting mm, run. Mm, got it. Yeah. So Talk to us first about uh, an you know an, if an entrepreneur is struggling with their finances and you know it's past the pandemic and they're just trying to make things work and they've you know the pandemic was a struggle it took a strain it was a strain on their finances how do you fix are there any quick easy fixes to an entrepreneur's <laughs> finances. Yeah. The first thing is you got to look at where you're at and just accept it. You know, I kind of call it like ripping the bandaid off. It's like, you just got to be like, Hey, this is where you're at. Yeah. Maybe you're not where you want to be. Maybe things have been messed up the last couple of years, but acknowledge where you're at. Like we're here and I want to get to this next plate, this next spot. Okay. Well, how do we get there? We go in and we create some automation. So I tell people, you know, the quickest win you can do anybody's listening to this is, is especially if you just have business. A lot of people I talk to, they're like, oh, we have business checking and then we use that and pay all the bills, et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, well, just have a savings account set up a business one and move money automatically. So at least you're starting to build up a reserve fund for the business. And then as you grow, you talk to your CPA and be like, hey, how much can I take as a distribution? Okay, cool. Take this much, start putting it into something outside of your business. That's the thing we saw in 2020 is the people that had money outside of their businesses were a lot less stressed than the people that had everything tied up in their business, especially in my industry. It was horrible. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So savings account, be disciplined and pull money out on a regular basis. And the biggest thing is automation, create an automation because <laughs> our human mind, we're like, oh, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. And you never do it. But if it's automatically done, you wake up in the morning, you check your accounts. You're like, oh, there's where'd this money come from? Like, oh yeah, it's been moving every three days or every five days. Mm. And then it becomes a game where you have fun. Like first thing people do is I'll mm. check it. Like, okay, I got this much in savings now. And it starts to give you that breathing room that we all crave so much as entrepreneurs because we're always reinvesting in our businesses. We're always pushing and, and trying to grow, but we got to take care of us too. Right, right. And this was a concept that was popularized by uh, Profit First, right? Yes, amazing Mike, book. You know, uh, setting up different bank accounts and then, you know, putting money aside uh, on a regular basis. Automation, you mentioned okay. that, so that you don't have to think about it. It just <laughs> automatically goes, goes in that account. Now, I know you're a big believer of passive income. Uh, why is passive income important? How does one create it? Man, it, it's the most important thing. The, and the older we get, the more we realize that you read anything on like Warren Buffett. And I want to say it's, I think it was like, I don't know the exact number now, but 
just the dividends he makes off Coca-Cola is more than the CEO makes in their salary. You know, it's like, and that's the most passive thing in the world is dividends. Mm. But, you know, if you're putting money away and you're saving and you're investing, because as we get older, you want to have your money making money while you're sleeping. You know, it's in the market. Obviously, as you're getting older, you have to talk to your financial person and be like, hey, you know, I want to make sure I got my my assets all balanced out. So I'm not too aggressive when versus when you're younger and you're just trying to make a bunch of money. But it is crazy because it takes so much pressure off, you know, when you're creating that and passive income gets a bad rap. People are like, well, you know, it's there's a lot of scams out there. They're like, oh, buy this and you'll get passive income or do this real estate thing, and you'll get passive income. And, and you you find out it's a lot of work actually, and there's nothing passive about it. You know, that's why I'm a huge fan of the stock market. Although, of course, last year has just been an anomaly where it was just like imploded. But you know, we're due for it. We I told people, you know, because we had the last recession it was back in 08. And like in 2018, I did a, a talk about, you know, the next recession and how to get ready for it. And obviously I didn't think it was going to be a pandemic and that would lead to a recession, which has been the worst of the worst. But even in this situation, you look for things like, hey, you know, what? I believe in this company, you know, it's going to be a longer term investment. Now, obviously, if you're older and you're retired, it's a whole different ballgame. But when you're accumulating assets and you're looking at it, you know, we're in a great time right now. You know, most of the damage is done, hopefully. And it's now it's like, OK. What do I believe in? What do I want to buy? Or you just do the Warren Buffett model and buy the S&P 500 and then just not be stressed out. <laughs> mm, got it. Why is developing wealth too slow and boring for most people? <laughs> yeah, I stole that one from uh, Jeff Bezos. That was what he said the first time that Warren Buffett broke down his investment strategy. And it was, it's such, I couldn't imagine being listening to that conversation of like Bezos interviewing Buffett, just, or just talk to him. He's like, Buffett laid out his investment plan and, and Bezos was like, why don't more people do that? And Buffett said, people don't want to get rich slow. I mean, I've been around the game for a while. I remember in 2001, they were all clowning on Buffett like, oh, you're not following the dot com. You're 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 done. You're old. You're past your prime. 2008, like, oh, you're not doing this. Crypto came along. He's like, I don't even know what crypto is. I'm not going to invest in it. I stick to my guns. Now he's outperformed mm. crypto. It's like the average person and it, it's you know you can see it when you go to the grocery store or the convenience store people are in line buying lottery tickets and they're trying to win the powerball and it's like if you ask that person like hey are you putting 200 bucks a month in an ira and they'd be like no i can't afford that i'm like you spent 400 dollars on lottery tickets and you got a better chance with a an ira than you do with that but we're just a get rich quick you know instant fulfillment society and it's it's takes discipline and time and just it's super boring when buffett said that i was like man that's like the greatest quote ever it's like nobody wants to get rich slow but he yeah. really, if you look at the chart he really didn't start making a lot of money to use in his 60s mm, mm, mm. yeah yeah there's a lot of wisdom there <laughs> yeah so to what kind of what's the secret to building wealth i mean it's you know you mentioned like you know discipline uh consistently investing automation uh Tell us, talk to us more about, about, you know, any other secrets in addition to that in terms of building wealth? Yeah, it's compound interest. You know, it goes back to Einstein saying it's the eighth wonder of the world. When you compound things, you don't have to do anything. It does it for you. So by investing consistently, repeatedly, not worrying about, not trying to time the market, not trying to be a trader. I mean, people can do it, but, you know, we've all been there and done that. Think you can, up, you can beat the market and... It's super tough, but if you're just constantly investing, constantly putting money away, dollar cost averaging, which is like, you're saying, hey, I can afford to put $300 a month away or $3,000 a month away. You're buying into the, your S&P 500 or whatever your advisor says, and you're doing that and it's compounding and the returns are compounding, the interest is compounding. You start seeing it and then you can put it into any uh, growth calculator and you look at it. And that's when I tell people like, man, plug some numbers in here. It's fun. Like to me, it's like the coolest thing you help people out and they're like, hey, I had no money. Now I got 10,000. How do I get to 100,000? We do this. Okay. And then the next jump, obviously, is a huge one. Everybody wants to get to the million. And then that's, that's the long, slow process. Mm -hmm. I was talking to one of my clients last week, and he was very averse from investing in the stock market. He's seen what's happened. He's like, <laughs> man, my money has just half. Yep. Uh, what, do you, what, what, do you, what advice do you give to a someone that feels very negative about the stock market. Man, that's the hardest thing too, is when the, and that's when the market's going great, everybody loves it. And I, I use one um, example, like I had friends that weren't buying Bitcoin, you know, they're like, Oh, Bitcoin, nothing. But then when it hit the all time high, everybody starts getting the, you know, FOMO fear of missing out. And I had friends that were like posting on Facebook, how do I buy Bitcoin? It's at 67,000. It's going to a million. And now when it goes down to like 15, they're like, I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. I'm like, but you were going to buy, hmm. you bought it at 67, but you won't buy it at 15. 
what changed? Mm. It's, it's our mindset is like, yes, the market goes up, the market goes down. And a lot of times, if you look at it, if you would stick to like the basics, the S&P 500 or a balanced portfolio, you didn't get crushed in the last year. But if you got greedy like me, other people sometimes you're like, ooh, Coinbase is going to go through the roof. And so you're buying it and you're looking at it, you're like, should I really be paying $400 a share for this? And people were, I mean, obviously they were, and now it's run down to like 12 bucks. You know, so that's the hardest thing is you have to have a disciplined system that you're following and listening to and not getting caught up in the hype. And that's one thing I tell people, like, I still dabble. Mm. I'm still, I believe in crypto. I believe a little bit, but I never put more money in the things that are super risky than I'm willing to just set on fire in the backyard. That's like the best advice I got from one of my mentors. He was like, cause I'd asked him, this is back in the day. like, Oh, I think I want to buy gas or oil futures. And he's like, do you understand it? I'm like, well, no, but it's, you can make a lot of money. And he's like, well, so I'm gonna give you a piece of advice. If it's something speculative that you really don't understand, just take the amount of money you want to take in the backyard and set on fire. And I'm like, well, it's not a lot of money. <laughs> so he's like, well, then just use that. Cause that's the thing is, you know, you might put, there are guys that put $2,000 in Bitcoin 10 years ago that had millions. And then you got guys that put hundreds of thousands of dollars in it at the top and now they have nothing. So it's like, you got to weigh the risk, the risk to reward. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. You know, it's really believing, you know, it's, it's believing in what you, what you're going to do, what you're investing in, believing in the company, the products, the services before. And it's, I guess that takes a bit of due diligence to do that <laughs> and being surrounded with the right people that can advise you as, as well. Let's, uh, yeah, this is interesting and, and good. Um, let's shift gears. Uh, for those of us with kids, uh, how do you give kids an unfair advantage in life? Man, I learned this the hard way. I, was, I still remember when I learned it. I was, you know, I grew up, only time my parents talked about money was, was how bad, you know, rich people were and how evil money was and how only the rich get richer and the poor get poor. And so I was like, man, money sucks. I grew up with that mentality. And then you know, I started doing jujitsu and you started hanging around with like doctors and lawyers and surgeons and entrepreneurs. And you hear how they talk to their kids. And I'm like, wait, this is not fair. It's like, they're talking to their kid about their business or their investments or things like that. It's like, I didn't learn this till I was 26 years old. And this kid's learning it at nine. So what I did, and, and I even did this at my uh, gym with the kids is I teach the kids, you know, especially my kids, you know, talking to them from the littlest age, talking about the stock market, talking about investing, talking about savings, talking about you know, talking about money all the time. Like at our house, we joke around like CNBC's on all day long. And like when my family comes over, my wife's family comes over and they know not to turn the channel because, you know, we're, we're a CNBC family. It's like, we got to know what's going on. And I, I call it like subliminally teaching my family because, you know, your kids don't want to listen all the time, but they watch what you're doing. They start picking things up. And if you start talking to your kids about money at a young age and, you know, let them realize money's not evil, you know, it's like, yeah, it can amplify. If you're a horrible person, we've seen, you know, scams and bad people, but the majority of people are good people that just don't understand what money can do. And the ones that do get it, they build up. So it's like, if you could educate them and just talk about it, you know, it makes a huge difference. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So my next question, I kind of, uh, it's a, it's a bit unique and different, uh, but I'm just going to throw it at, yeah. at you. Why are most people unhappy no matter how much money they, they have? <laughs> It's crazy. You see it. People, you know, with a lot of money, just taking their own lives and doing stupid yeah. stuff and blowing their yeah, lives up. Yeah. And one thing I learned, and it was, I learned the unfortunate way that my little sister passed away from complications of a brain aneurysm when she was 34. And she had never done anything. She was always one of those people like, oh, someday I'm going to New York or someday I'm doing this, someday I'm doing that. And I looked at when she passed away, I looked at myself and I'm like, all I'm doing is trying to get to the next goal. And when I got to the next goal. I never celebrate the next goal. We've all been there. Entrepreneurs like, oh, when we get to, when I get to 100K a year, I'm going to be set. And you get to hundred, what happens? You're like, okay, 150, 200. Mm. And it's like, I realized one day I'm like, I'm not having fun. It's like, I'm doing well. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm doing these things. And I'm, I'm like, tell my wife, like, Hey, we're going to go on this trip someday. So after that, I started like, you know what, when we hit an achievement, I celebrate, I plan trips. We do stuff as a family. It's like, Hey, we hit this mm. goal, you know, and just try to really enjoy the journey. Cause you know, it's like that quote you always hear that, you know, the journey is the best part. The destination is you get there and you're like, everybody's Probably listen to this is probably planned like your dream vacation. You plan it, it's all in your head. It's like it'd be amazing. And you get there and you're like, okay, now I got sand in my shorts and I'm dirty and I'm hot. And I'm, my kids are driving me crazy. This vacation is not fun. But the journey, and then you realize, oh my God, the journey was the best part. Like planning it, taking the family, doing this. When you get there, you're like, huh, okay, there's a beach and water. <laughs> mm -hmm. So true. So true. Uh, we're constantly looking forward and striving and then 
that becomes the focus and then we lose the we lose the the, the path the road the journey to that to that destination and so yeah that's the funnest part yeah. when <laughs> yeah 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 and i think it it requires a, a certain level of mindfulness and just stopping and say man you know got so much you know you know and really i mean be really being mindful to kind of count our blessings right and because we do have so much that we all have going for us even though we may be striving for a goal and we may be feeling like man i'm so far from reaching that goal <laughs> or i'm not going to reach that goal but yet we have so much as well so yeah we're so lucky it's like you, i tell people if they ever feel down go travel to a third world country and spend a week there and it's like you just like wow we have running water and you know it's like when you go to a yeah. country and you're like you can't drink the water it's like uh right. okay this is not good <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, yeah. No, I came back recently, just last week from uh, from a few weeks being away, traveled international. I mean, Laos, Asia, India, different parts oh. of India as well. And uh, yeah, it's very eye opening. It's a great reminder of, you know, how much how much we have. And, you know, it, and people are happy. <laughs> they don't have much. They That's have, the crazy you know, part. Just, I tell people, yeah, like you said the yeah. same thing that I tell people, it's like, you go to some of these places and they don't have very much and they're like the happiest people and they'll share like, you are like, Oh, come on for dinner. And you're like, you don't have, right. any, like, do I pay? <laughs> what do I do? And you feel bad. And they're, you almost insult right. them. Cause like, well, no, I want to give this to you. And you're like, right. Okay. It's an they're, and they're so happy. Yeah. 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 They want to share and celebrate what yeah. they have. And so, yeah, it is, uh, it's very different and very unique and a great reminder of, for us that live in North America that, you know, we do have, for the most part, we have a lot, you know, oh. got a lot going for us. Wow. This has been great. Uh, Paul <laughs> really appreciate it. We're coming to the end. Uh, I want to ask you kind of a question uh, relating to finances in a family when a husband and a, and a wife, uh, they're not on the same page financially. They've got different the ways, different priorities that they're looking at, you know, how to spend money, how to save money. How do you get your spouse on the same page financially? I love that question. Yeah, that's what I've gone through. It's, I've been married for 22 years now. It's like, I don't know how. And I think one of the reasons I've made it, you know, a lot of my friends haven't, is just being transparent and talking about money. You know, like I said, take with the kids. Like my wife, when we first started out, we were broke. We talked about money. We didn't have any money. And then as you start making more money, you're like, if you're not on the same page, it's really tough. I have friends that hide stuff from their wives and it blows up on them later on because they weren't being you know, like, Oh, Hey, I did this thing. And they're like, why didn't you talk to me? And then they get the huge fight. So I like to do, I call it a money date. I forget where I stole it from. It was someone else's idea. I'm sure I read somewhere, but you know, go to dinner and just talk about money and be like, Hey, this is where we're at. This is where I want to get to. What do you want? And then in the beginning, my wife was super like, oh, I don't have any goal financial goals. I just want to, you know, raise kids and, and do that. I'm like, well, so that's great. But someday we're going to have to do other things. And then, the more we talked about it, the more open she got. And then I would make mistakes. So I'm thinking like, like during the pandemic, I was like, okay, you know, our business is not essential. Subways are essential. Let's go open a subway and blah, blah, blah. And sandwich. And she's like, well, what are you going to do if somebody calls in sick and we got to go make sandwiches? Do you want to be a sandwich person? And I'm like, no, that sounds horrible. She's like, I'm like, oh my God, you saved me so much money and headache. Cause you know, cause if I would have came home and been like, Hey honey, guess what? We bought a subway. She would have murdered me. And I have friends that do stuff like that. Or it's like, it, sooner you can like, same with kids and your spouse, just talk about money. And, and take that off the plate. So it's not even a, you know, a thing that where you're trying to hide stuff and, you know, and do mm -hmm. that. Because the closer you can get to the same page, and obviously we're never going to be hundred percent on the same page, but you know, you, the closer you get, the better it is. Cause then, you know, you don't have to stress out about like, Oh, I hid this from my wife or, Oh, she you know, has this shopping problem. It's like, well, let's talk about it. Hmm. Communication, right? It's Huge. communication and then it's transparency. Right. It's being, uh, you know, speaking from the heart, it's, you know, sharing, <laughs> right. Share, sharing how we feel, what oh, we yeah. value. So the other person knows. Yeah. And she keeps me, you know, in line where it's like, it pushes me to, to be, to do better. Cause it's like, we talk about it and I'm like, I'm, I want to do this. And, you know, we were joking around like the other day, I was like, I want to get into Airbnbs. And she's like, you said B and B's, you didn't say Airbnb. And I'm like, Oh, you caught that. I didn't even catch that. Cause in my head, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm like, why would I buy one when I can go get four? And she's like, well, how about mm. you start with one and go from there? Don't use Airbnbs, use Airbnb. And I was like, okay, that's why I love you. <laughs> it's like, you keep me, <laughs> you keep me grounded because entrepreneurs, we do some crazy stuff. You know, it's like, yeah, mm. you know, buy one or buy four. Maybe I should buy one and see if I like it. <laughs> right. But right. I'm just looking at cash flow and the numbers are running. I'm like, oh, if we did this and this, this, she goes, 
what if we hate it? And I was like, right again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's wisdom there. <laughs> oh, well, this has been amazing. Um, what's, uh, how can listeners, what's the best way for listeners to reach out to you? Yeah. You can go to my website, uh, paulhalmy.com and on social media. I love Instagram. It's my favorite. It's the happier place. I call it the happier social media, uh, Paul dot or Paul period Halmy uh, on Instagram. And if there's a little bad thing about Instagram is the scam bot things on there. So like, I've never asked for crypto. Don't ever send me crypto. Cause it's not me. Yeah. That's the only thing I hate about Instagram. But other than that, Instagram is my favorite place. Great. Awesome. Great. Final words of wisdom before we finish off. Final words of wisdom. Ah, just enjoy the journey. I mean, we're, we're so lucky. It's like, I have friends all the time, you know, complain about their jobs, about their boss. And I'm like, man, I just, I basically plan my day and I do what I, I want to do and I get to do it. And yeah, I can, if I want more, I got to do more. But at the end of the day, it's like, I'm building this life where I, I'm an entrepreneur. I get to do what I want and enjoy it. So just really enjoy the journey and, and just have fun with it. Awesome. Paul, thank you so much, man. This was amazing. Really enjoyed <laughs> thank it. You. I had a great time. That was awesome. Oh, by fast. Yeah, it does. <laughs> you take care. <laughs> Thanks, you too.